You're listening to the CD Baby. CD Baby. CD Baby DIY Musician Hey there, and welcome to episode number 102 of the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast. My name is Kevin Bruner, your host for the show, and on this episode, you're going to hear from Brian Calhoun from Sound Exchange. Sound Exchange is a performing rights organization, which means they often get lumped in with other PROs like ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC. But it's important to note that Sound Exchange is completely different when it comes to the type of performance royalties they are collecting for artists and musicians. If you want to maximize your income in the new music economy, which is relying more and more on streaming services like Pandora, then you'll want to take note of all the details in this podcast and be sure you understand what service Sound Exchange offers to artists and musicians. So uh, let's get to my interview with Brian. Well, joining me on the phone is Brian Calhoun of Sound Exchange. Brian, how are you doing? I'm doing great. Glad to be here. How are you? I'm doing well. Uh, it's good to get you on the podcast because Sound Exchange is one of those companies that had communication with for years here at CD Baby and, you know, letting artists know that uh, there could possibly be some money for them. But it's been surprising to see how many artists are still confused about what Sound Exchange is, what you guys do, and um, why they should be involved with what you're doing in the first place. So uh, to start things off, can you just give us a little bit of uh, your background, what you do there, and a little bit of the history of Sound Exchange to set things up? Sure, sure, no problem. Um, so my name is Brian Calhoun. I'm the Vice President of New Media and External Affairs here at Sound Exchange. Um, Sound Exchange is a nonprofit performing rights organization, and we collect and distribute royalties from services that stream recordings uh, like satellite radio, internet radio, and cable radio, and we pay those royalties to featured performers and the owners of the sound recordings who are usually record labels. We collect, it's a it's a statutory license, so all these services opt in, all, many services opt in for it, and because it's a statutory license, we collect for artists and labels, whether they know it or not. Mm -hmm. We basically have the authorization from the government to be this sole collective to do this. So what happens is there are many artists and labels who we collect for that may not know that they're entitled to these royalties mm -hmm. or have just failed to register because we can't pay people unless they register. So that's why we've been working so closely with you guys over at CD Baby to help notify artists and labels that they have money waiting here at Sound Exchange. Mm -hmm. So some people tend to be, some people can be confused by this because it's a relatively new right. Uh, it was established in 1995. The money really started to become significant over the course of the past few years as satellite radio has grown, uh, internet radio like Pandora has grown, and, and so forth. And we're sending out quite a bit of money. Uh, this is, uh, you know, we're here in August 2010, and so far this year we've already sent out uh, over $100 million. And uh, we have another distribution coming up here in uh, the next few weeks, and we'll be sending out another, you know, we'll be sending out tens of millions of dollars again. Wow. How often do you, are you guys paying out? Is it a monthly? Well, we generally pay out quarterly, mm -hmm. but last year we actually made five payments. So, so we had um, we had our normal quarterly distributions and one supplemental distribution just because we're trying to get the money out as quickly as possible to all the artists and labels that are entitled to receive it. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, you mentioned that it started in 1995. What happened that, I mean, who gave the authority and whose idea was it to set Sound Exchange up? Because I know for a lot of artists, it, it seemed like, hey, this just popped up out of nowhere. Yeah, well, 
what happened in, in 1995, the right was established because that was one of the big things is there was no right in sound recording for performance verses. So what happened was there was a, a, a law passed that said that services uh, that stream recordings online or through digital services, uh, again, that include that includes satellite radio, internet radio, and cable radio, that not only do they have to pay the uh, the writers and the publishers, the uh, you know, for the underlying composition, but they also had to pay for the use of the sound recording. And when that happened, that like set things in motion for sound exchange to be uh, created. And initially, you know, some people talk about our, our affiliation with the RIAA, the Recording Industry Association of America. And initially, the RIAA put up the money that was required to build the system to be able to do these uh, uh, royalty collections and distributions. A few years later, SoundExchange spun off and is an independent uh, nonprofit organization. Um, and we have been essentially authorized by the uh, Copyright Office to be the collective to do this. So we are the one company that does it, and we have a board of directors made up of 18 people, half are artists representatives and half are label representatives. And they oversee our operations to ensure that we're efficient and that we're doing the right thing. And they have all the incentive in the world to make sure that we are operating properly because the money that we pay out goes to the people that they represent. Mm -hmm. I guess at this point we should make clear that this is just in the U.S., correct? Right. Well, actually, you know, one of the things that's interesting is, yeah, we just collect in the U.S., but... It's something that's recognized all over the world. The one thing that makes the United States different is that we don't have that same right for terrestrial radio, which are AM and FM broadcasts. So when a recording is played on your favorite FM, local FM station, they have to pay ASCAP, BMI, and CSAC, who are performing rights organizations that collect for the writer, but they do not have to pay for the use of the sound recording. So we don't collect, and that's what that's what sets the United States apart from many countries around the world. <clears throat> it also leads into something else that we've been working really hard on is to get the law changed. There's a piece of legislation called the Performance Right Act, which we're actively trying to get passed, that would require AM and FM radio stations to finally start paying for the use of the sound recording. So we find it we find it fundamentally unfair that a service uh, or, or an AF, AM and FM radio station can play somebody's sound recording and not either ask for permission or provide any compensation and make money. They play recordings, people listen, they sell advertising against those listeners and keep the money without compensating those who have brought them the listeners in the first place. So <clears throat> it's unfortunate that the United States doesn't recognize this right as of yet, because in other countries around the world where they do recognize that right, <clears throat> and when U.S. artists' works are played on those stations, U.S. artists are not compensated because here we don't recognize the rights of their artists. Mm -hmm. And so there's, uh, you know, this, this, these, uh, we can't enter into these reciprocal deals with these uh, territories for AM and FM radio broadcasts because in the United States, we don't do it. Mm -hmm. So we're trying to get the law changed. Now, however, we do have a number of reciprocal deals in place that are limited in scope to digital performances with a number of territories. But we're hoping that we're going to be able to get this law passed and that, uh, um, the United States and uh, U.S. artists will finally start reaping the benefits of uh, their work being used. You know, we estimate that uh, U.S. artists lose out on about $100 million a year because when, you know, stations in Argentina and Australia and U.K. and France, when they use their works, they don't pay the U.S. artists. Mm -hmm. If they did pay them, it would be an estimated $100 million a year in income for U.S. artists. Wow. It, it, this uh, legislation that you're lobbying to get passed, is that the same legislation I've heard uh, some of the radio stations advertise you know, against calling it a radio tax? 
Exactly. Okay. They're, they're mislabeling it, and they call it a tax because that's a scary word, and nobody likes taxes. But taxes fund government. This is a royalty paid to the creators of intellectual property when their work is used and somebody else makes money off of it. Mm -hmm. You mentioned kind of briefly ASCAP, BMI, CSAC, and comparing how the writers are paid. And I think this is where one of the things where artists get really hung up on, especially independent artists who might not have had radio airplay and had uh, a uh, traditional airplay and, and seeing how the money funneled through ASCAP and BMI compared to what you guys are talking about. Can can you break that down a little bit more and then kind of give some examples of what you're talking about as far as like an artist benefiting from their recording? Because I think the average indie artist thinks, well, I wrote the song. And so right. where there's a lot of situations where the artist didn't write the song, where they would benefit from this. You're, you're, you're right. You know, there is a fundamental uh, principle that artists need to understand, especially indie artists well, and everybody who works in the music industry. And that is that there are two separate copyrights within every recording. One copyright is the underlying composition or the notes and the lyrics on a page. So when you write a song, the words and the notes and the melody that you write down. That is a, there is a copyright there for who wrote it. Mm -hmm. The other copyright is a copyright in the individual sound recording. So a particular performance of that composition as it is recorded has a separate copyright. So there's the sound recording copyright and the copyright in the underlying composition. When you write a song, you are paid through ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC when your works are played on AM and FM radio or in bars and in clubs and on internet radio and the other places where sound exchange collects for those per for performances. All right, so if you write a song, you get paid through them. Now, if you are the one who records the song and or you are the owner of the sound recording, so most indie artists own their own masters, then you get paid on the sound recording copyright through sound exchange when that work is performed on internet radio, satellite radio, cable radio. Mm -hmm. And the, the yeah, I think so. And I, the one example I always uh, tend to tell artists is, like, I think someone like Bob Dylan's a perfect example. So many of his songs were made hugely famous by other artists, and especially before the internet era, um, Bob Dylan reaped all the rewards for other artists doing their versions of his songs. Obviously, they probably had record sales of their own albums, but as far as like royalties that were generated. And, and so I think what I think it's important for artists to know what you guys are doing is trying to say, hey, your version of that song is what made it popular. You should get some of the money. That's absolutely right. So that's it's a great example. So Bob Dylan wrote All Along the Watchtower. It was made famous by Jimi Hendrix. When All Along the Watchtower is played on an FM radio station, Bob Dylan gets paid. Jimi Hendrix's estate does not. Mm -hmm. uh, and he's, and uh, the recording is on MCA, which is part of Universal. So Universal doesn't receive any money either. Mm -hmm. Now, when Jimi Hendrix's version is played on Pandora or satellite radio like Sirius or XM, mm -hmm. Bob Dylan still gets paid through ASCAP, BMI, or CSAC, whichever one it is he's affiliated with. But Jimi Hendrix's estate and Universal Records get paid for the sound recording through sound exchange. Mm -hmm. I think that's as clear as it could be made. I, I know that some artists, that the idea of the income stream still is confusing to them, but uh, um, how, how are you guys getting info about the music being streamed? Are they reporting, are, are these services reporting playlists, or do you do some sort of survey? Well, actually, no, that's one of the things that also differentiates us is that we report on full census for, uh, 
in almost, I think almost every case, I think it's 95% at this point of the services that are reporting to us, we pay out on full census, which means we pay out on every single track. So we don't take, uh, you know, let's say a two week sample every quarter and just pay out based on that. The services all as a part of the uh, as a part of the law are required to submit to us reports of use that tell us what they've played and how many times they've played it and then we use that information along with their fees to ultimately pay out all of the appropriate rights holders okay so it should be you know like if your music's getting any uh, significant streaming on any of the services out there it should show up on sound exchanges radar that's correct that is correct. And it doesn't matter if you're you two or you're, you know, just a, you know, a little independent artist who's recorded in your, you know, in your basement. It doesn't matter. The the plays are all identical. Okay. Um, who sets the, the royalty rates that uh, Sound Exchange collects? Uh, the rates are set by the Copyright Royalty Board. Uh, frequently just known as the CRB, they, uh, there's, there are proceedings where sound exchange presents, we present our case and we say, we feel like the rate should be this and services say our, we feel like the rate should be that. And there's usually some type of a compromise and the rates are set periodically. Uh, there was, uh, last year there was something called the webcaster settlement act, which gave us the ability to negotiate rates outside of what the copyright royalty board set. And a number of the rates for services, uh, was, was uh, reduced. Um, there was quite a bit of uh, there was quite a bit of buzz about that uh, last year, but we're actually pretty happy right now that so many services are opting in for specific types of uh, uh, licenses or payment schedules that work within the confines of the type of business that they have structured. Mm-hmm. I know that uh, Pandora and Sound Exchange were in the news a few years back. Oh yeah, over yeah, over working yeah. this out. So uh, yeah, no, and, and we're really, I mean, you know, we're really happy. You know, Pandora sends quite a bit of money to us, which we send out to the the, the artists and the labels. Um, but you know, we feel like we got to a place where uh, they have a rate that allows them to grow, uh, sustain their business, uh, but still compensates the artists and the labels. Mm-hmm. I'd like to find out a little bit more specifically about who exactly can get paid through Sound Exchange. You said, you know, obviously the copy, the the sound recording owner, which is pretty easy to figure out if you're that or not. But then you've also said featured artist. What right. re, uh, what uh, qualifies you to be considered a featured artist on a recording? So it's generally the name that is most prominently featured on the packaging. So if it says Jay-Z, it's Jay-Z. If it says Jay-Z featuring Beyonce, it's Jay-Z and Beyonce on the, on the recording. Mm-hmm. And that's the way we get paid. Now, if you're an independent artist and you own your own masters, you're entitled to be paid as the copyright owner and the featured performer. So when you fill out your registration forms with us, you need to fill out both parts of it, both mm-hmm. as the featured performer and the sound recording copyright owner. Okay. So is there any anyone else that falls under the, the, the artist side that gets paid just like the main featured artist? Sure. Well, what we actually do is we also pay, uh, there is a, a fund which is administered by the unions to pay background musicians and session players as well. Oh, okay. So if, uh, like, I'm a, personally a guitar player and I've played on a lot of other people's albums, what would I need to do in order to um, tap into that if I know a lot of my performances on albums are being streamed? Well, what you would need to do is you would need to go to, you can go to our website, mm-hmm. uh, which is soundexchange.com, and uh, you, there's a link in there to RA Royalties, and you will just follow that and to contact them, and they will help you. Now, if you are a member of a band and say your band has, there's four of you, four of you in the group, you would be entitled to 25%. Mm-hmm. 
Okay, so that so that's one thing for people to understand that if they're banned, they're considered the featured performer. Everyone in the band, and that's correct. Okay, that's correct. You know, one of the things that we did too uh, is on, on our website. You'll see uh, we have some videos uh, right at SoundExchange.com. There's a video, and it kind of walks through some of the basics of oh, what we do and how things are split. But we ha- we have a number of videos kind of sprinkled throughout the website and also on our YouTube channel, which is youtube.com slash sound exchange. And it walks you through a number of these things too. So I know it's a whole lot of information and I suspect people might be rewinding uh, the podcast yeah, yeah. and going back. But there's also quite a bit of information there uh, in our videos. Yeah, and and I, I'll put links to that information on uh, the podcast uh, website, and because um, it's definitely important for artists to know. Because uh, you know, I see you you guys being a big part, especially the indie artist community. Is internet streaming becomes the way people listen to music that oh, yeah. uh, you, that you guys are going to play a big role in in the future success of artists. Um, I, I know that uh, I see Sound Exchange's name mentioned a lot when it comes to you know internet and satellite radio and general copyright issues. And um, you mentioned uh, that one new piece of legislation. Are there any other hot button issues uh, that you guys are involved with at the moment that uh, um, artists might find interesting? Well, that's certainly the big one. But you know, one of the thing, one of the big problems that plagues our industry period is a lack of really good information and data around recordings. So we remember we pay out based on the way services report to us. Well, if you're an artist, you're a label and you give your recording to uh, a service and you don't give them the proper information around who you are, your song title and your label name, the service may not know what to report to us and that will impact your ability to get paid. So for instance, if a service plays a song and they have no information on it and then they send to us their playlist and it says title on title track three artist, unknown label promo only you're not going to get paid (laughs) well that's that's a really good point i didn't even think about that aspect of it because in uh, the internet world i know that a lot of artists are submitting music directly even pandora artists are submitting directly and um, i i know that the way pandora does it they're they're doing their best to get all that information. Um, but what is the bare minimum that a, an artist should make sure that um, a service has in order for them to be able to report correctly to you guys? Artist name, song title, label name. Those are the most important things. And then if you have it, ISRC code, album title, and any other information. You just want to make sure, you know, what, what I tell people is, you know, when you're in the mastering process, Make sure that you get all the the accurate metadata tagged in your uh, tagged in your recording. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, is and if an artist doesn't really like if they're just their own independent label themselves, is it is it still important that they put a name in there and then register with your site? Absolutely. With okay. Very very much so. You know, it's it's pretty exciting that we have some really small independent artists, people that you know I've certainly never heard of who you know, we see making thousands of dollars a quarter. It's just, it's amazing. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. You know, and you know, I don't want to set people's expectations uh, too high falsely, but you know, if you end up getting some of your recordings played significantly on, you know, a, you know, obviously the bigger services, you know, it, it can turn out to be quite a bit of money. Yeah. And I, I think that's one of the cool things about what you guys are doing is that, um, you know, between all the performance rights organizations and other opportunities that are now available to artists, it's multiple income streams that can start to add up to to being a significant income. Absolutely, absolutely. You're 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 so right. One of the things that we put together was a new artist checklist, which kind of talks about some of the things that you need to do to make sure that your protections are in place and that you're 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 working on 
developing revenue streams from all of the uh, sources that you have uh, at your disposal. Mm-hmm. So that's another thing that's on our website, uh, which I think has turned out to be a pretty helpful tool for a lot of people. And, of course, Sound Exchange is on the list. <laughs> yeah, uh, I know that at CD Baby we've emailed our artists on multiple occasions about the, you guys having money for them. Um, where can somebody find out whether or not um, Sound Exchange has money that needs to be paid out to for their recording? Well, like you mentioned, if you're an artist and you're on CD Baby and you've received a notification from CD Baby, mm-hmm. then you are, you likely have money f- from uh, uh, from recordings uh, from your recordings being used by these services, and you should contact us right away. So that's definitely number one. And you know, I actually I was going to say this later, but I, I want to definitely thank you all publicly um, for for helping us notify artists. Uh, that we have money for. Um, so that's number one. Then you can also go to our website, which again is soundexchange.com. And there's, uh, there's two things, there's two places where you can look. We have the, there's a, 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 an unpaid artist list, but that list actually isn't completely current. That was just people who were subject to lose money if they didn't register mm-hmm. uh, in two, by 2006 for royalties through 2001. But what you want to do is go into our plays database, and there's a link there for it as well. You just do a quick registration, which is you know you just you know create a username and a password, and then you can log in and then do a search, and you can search for your label name, search for your song title, search by uh, your artist name, and see if recordings have been reported to us that are yours. Mm-hmm. And then you'll want to certainly make sure that you, if you find some stuff up there, then you'll definitely want to make sure that you, uh, that you get, that you get registered. Now, just because there's, uh, the services have reported it doesn't necessarily mean that, uh, you've accumulated royalties. You have to accumulate at least $10 worth of royalties in order to be paid. Mm-hmm. Uh, but we always encourage everybody to register. Yeah. And it's important for artists to know that, uh, you know, it, internet streams, it's not like they pay a dollar a piece. <laughs> yes, that's correct. That is, that, is, that, is not, that is not the case. That is not the case. So it does take a little bit of significant uh, streaming in order to start building up some. But, you know, the, the, with the internet, the, the ability for people to stream could be endless. It's just up to the artist to generate that demand. Um, right. Well, uh, my last question for you is, uh, do you ever see sound exchange being given the right to collect for traditional broadcast radio here in the U S well, that is what this performance right act fight is all about. I mean, I am very hopeful that it will, that it will, uh, that it will pass. We are closer now than we've ever been. Uh, you know, this is not something that we have just decided we want to do this is a fight that's been going on for 80 years Mm -hmm. and we are now at a point where it has the bill has passed out of the judiciary committees on both the house and senate sides and we have been sitting at the table talking with the broadcasters about what a deal could look like so for years, for well, for decades, they were completely stonewalling us and say, there's no way we'll ever do this. Well, now we're at a point where we're actually negotiating. So we're, we're remaining hopeful, but, you know, it, I would say cautiously optimistic. So it could still be years down the road before anything is finalized. Uh, it could be, but again, we are much closer now than we have uh, we have ever been. Okay. All right. Well, we'll be uh, stay tuned. Stay tuned. <laughs> we'll stay. We'll definitely be uh, be listening and uh, watching to see what uh, happens with with that and uh, the future of Sound Exchange and. Um, Brian, I, I really appreciate you coming on the podcast and and helping clear up some of the misconceptions that have been flying around there in the indie artist community. And I, I hope that uh, artists head over to your site and check it out. And we'll put links on the podcast page so they can click right over and, and get signed up. Fantastic. Yeah. And, you know, I just, I'll, again, the website, thesoundexchange.com. Our YouTube channel is... 
youtube.com slash sound exchange. You can find us also on Twitter and Facebook at those sites.com slash sound exchange. Uh, our phone number is 202-640-5858. And please don't hesitate to call, email, at message us on Twitter, whatever it is. <laughs> Get in touch with us. All right. Well, um, I'm sure you'll see some artists heading your way from the podcast. That's, that's fantastic. I, I really appreciate it. Thanks right. so much. All right. Thanks, Brian. Thanks again to Brian for coming on the podcast. I'll put links to Sound Exchange on the podcast website at cdbabypodcast.com. I'm curious if we have artists in our listening audience that have made any sort of significant income through Sound Exchange. If yes, please share with us, and I mean your story, not the money. You can uh, call our listener line at 206 426 5683 or email us at info at cdbabypodcast.com and you can always leave a comment on the podcast website at cdbabypodcast.com just curious to see what uh, sort of streaming revenue you're seeing if it's all through pandora or other services or if you can even tell where it's coming from well that's going to do it for this episode we'll see you next time You've been listening to the CD Baby DIY Musician Podcast, broadcasting from Portland, Oregon, USA. 